I think one, one of the challenges that, uh, that, that we face in, um, in our culture is that the Christian community has been doing counseling for centuries. And a lot of times when, we, when Christians think about um, soul care, uh, we think um, that, the, that we want to give spiritual soul care. Uh, we, 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 we send people to a, our pastor, and, and then they can talk about Jesus. And if they need psychological help, then we, then we send them to a counselor or a psychotherapist, and they won't talk about Jesus, and, and, but they will get psychological help. And that's because while the Christian tradition has been doing their own form of counseling for centuries, an, another model of therapy arose in the late 1800s that now dominates Western culture. And it's, it's, it, it controls counseling and psychotherapy, and it controls the field of psychology. And um, part of the, the agenda that I have this, this week is to um, introduce a model that you may have already been familiar with, uh, or maybe not, but a model where the local church has um, a a primary role to play in the care of souls of God's people. And it is the, like the, the front lines of the Christian mental health field is how I refer to it. I use that language even though it's kind of loaded and a little shocking. But because that's where I think people should go first when they have needs. And, and what we've done, uh, people have done research on this, at least in the States, and and, and they find that about 60% of Americans go to their pastor. I think that was the statistics I saw, um, at least in Texas. Maybe that's a little different than around other, other states. Um, when they have a, a mental health need, They're, that's the first person they go to. And I think that's, that's a part of the legacy of, of Christianity. And I think that's a good thing. But I, I imagine a continuum of, of soul care from the local church to to mental health professionals who are just as Christ-centered as the pastors that send people to them because pastors can't do everything. They got a lot to do, from what I can tell. That, you know, a lot of important things that they're charged by God to do. They can't do all the soul care that is needed in, among the people of God. And so I imagine Christian counselors, Christian uh, counseling centers, Christian mental hospitals, which has been uh, common over the last few centuries, are also resources that can work hand in, in glove with the local churches and pastoral uh, care that happens. Uh, each of them having uh, their own calling and location, but all of them just as Christ-centered. So this is a dream. This is a dream that I feel is alive here at ELF and some of the Christian organizations that I'm a part of and I, conferences that I go to. But it's a, it's, as you all know, it's very far from being realized. It's, it's, it's uh, stunningly unrealized in our day. But we have to do something, so we pray and, and we uh, go to conferences and, and maybe we get more training and um, we, do, we do the best that we can. So what I, what I want to uh, talk about today is um, this, this may not be um, the, the best talk uh, for, uh, for uh, everyone in this group, I'm, but I, I'm using the word psychotherapy because I, part of my calling as an academic is to develop models of psychotherapy that are just as sophisticated as the secular models that are out there that can be taught at graduate programs in America and in, in my dream world that could be taught even at public universities. Just like there's, you, can, there, there, you can take courses in, in gay lesbian therapy, uh, feminist therapy, Marxist therapy, no kidding. You know, that so, so, and, and we, and for sure, Buddhist therapy. There's a lot of folks that are doing Buddhist therapy in, in America, and I bet, I bet in Europe as well. 
Um, so, but the challenge there is that we need to develop re research programs and um, we need to write texts that are written at those kinds of levels. And that's, that's uh, what I want to share with you is, uh, today is um, at least uh, something that is approaching that, uh, a model like that. That's my goal. I haven't attained it yet by a long shot. But um, so, what you remember I said earlier in the week that a, a Christian psychology approach is one that starts with the Bible and the Christian traditions. And then it, it reads good stuff that comes from common grace, creation grace, to help enrich and inform, and to use David Paulison's term, provoke us to do the best job we can in, in our uh, world. And so that's basically what, what, uh, what I'm doing today. So what does psychotherapy in Christ uh, look like? Well, it begins particularly with union, union with Christ. You might say it begins with God. Everything is all about, it's about, it's all about God. It's about his glory. We, it's a God-centered world within which we live. But in terms of, of, of therapeutic uh, um, uh, models and strategies, concepts here, a concept, I want to say perhaps the most important therapeutic concept in the Christian faith is union with Christ. Now, I use therapeutic concept because I, 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 I think it's a little provocative. And, and I, uh, but, you know, honestly, it's really not that controversial. Uh, therapeuo, the Greek word therapeuo, simply means healing. So psychotherapy really only means soul healing. That's, that is Christianity. It's, it's always been about the healing of the soul in Christ's name. So union with Christ from a Christian standpoint is a therapy concept. It just so happens that it's come to us from God and been established by God. Well, what is union with Christ? Let, let me give you uh, six themes of union with Christ. One is it's a union of representation. So Christ represents us before the Father. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places so that when we pray, we can have the confidence that Christ is praying for us on our behalf, cleaning and tidying up our prayers so that they are 100% acceptable to our Father. So the, Jesus represents us now in heaven. It's also a union of shared meaning. Now, what do I mean by that? Jesus is perfectly righteous, and his perfect righteousness has been given to you so that you are righteous as Christ is. And so you share some of the same meaning of Christ. You are also a holy one, a saint. Christ is the holy one. You are also a child of God. Christ is the child of God, the son of God. And so there are certain, we're not identical to him in that respect, but we are children of God, like he is uh, uh, analogous to. And, um, and, and so this is the, some of the greatest treasures of, of, the, of the gospel are these blessings that come to us because of our union with Christ, because we share some of the same meaning, some of the same characteristics that have been given to us by God, the Father. The, the moment you became a Christian, you were, you were made holy, declared holy. And this is the foundation of all Christian counseling, all therapy. Thirdly, it's a union of mutual indwelling. This is a mystery. We don't understand this really well, but God lives in you through the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ. And you live in God. You dwell together. And, and psychologically, you're different than you were before you were a Christian. Do you remember being a non-Christian when you were all alone, when you didn't have God at all? Now, I'm not saying I think about that indwelling every day. I don't. I, I wish I did. But every time I think about it, like when I'm doing my, in my devotion time, and I think, wow, God is inside me. I'm like, Wow. That's different, and it's different psychologically. you got an infinite being that dwells in you 
And when you were a non-Christian, you didn't have that. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great psychological blessing of being united to Christ. Fourthly, it's a union of koinonia. Koinonia is that Greek word that means communion or fellowship. It means having the fullest kind of relationship you can have with another person. And we are, have entered into the fellowship, John says in 1 John 1, the fellowship of the Father and the Son. There's no better love relationship in the universe or outside the universe. And we're in that fellowship. We're in that koinonia, accepted. Some theologians have dared to say that, that the God... That, that the triune God has invited us into their Trinitarian communion. It almost sounds like scandalous to say that, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful truth that the New Testament teaches us. Fifth, it's a union of story. Your story, when you, when you gave your life to Jesus, your story entered into the story of Christ. And Christ's story, ever since, is being woven into your story so that more and more your story is characterized by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Do you have some bad days? I know I do. Some days I don't even feel like a Christian. It's funny, you know, when I came here, I was kind of in a down spiritual space. I was just feeling like, Lord, I'm just not, I, don't, I shouldn't be speaking at a conference like this this week, you know. And if I just focused on the state of my soul, I probably shouldn't. But I'm in union with Christ. And, and I'm bearing in my body the death of Christ. And, I'm, and I was experiencing it, the death, the unbelief, the uh, resistance to God, the just, I don't feel like a Christian right now. You know, thankfully, I don't feel that way every day. Some people do more than others. Some people struggle with this more than others. But, uh, but we all have dark nights of the soul, what the Puritans call spiritual desertion. It's actually a part of a normal Christian life. That's why I'm not afraid to talk about it, you know, <laughs> because I read other Christians that talk about this sort of thing. But thankfully, I, when, I, when, I, when I wake up out of my spiritual darkness or slumber, what I realize is, oh, this is a part of my union with Christ. And I need to take this death that I'm experiencing it to the Jesus and say, boy, God, I feel pretty dead today. I confess my deadness, my spiritual unbelief to you. And I ask that you take it away from me and free me from it and raise me from the dead. And, and over the course of my life, that's happening, I would say, with greater consistency now than it was when I was a young believer. The first 10 years of my Christian life, Man, I was like tossed to and fro, uh, really a lot. But, but over the, you know, I've been a Christian almost 40 years now. It might even be 40 years. Uh, and, and over time, there's been this very gradual growing stability. And so now, it's, Christ's story is being woven into my story, and it's stabilizing me. So I'm not so freaked out by my unbelief or my spiritual struggles and I know that the Lord is going to raise me from the dead again, hopefully in my devotion time, but usually, you know, within the next week or so, you know, or two, or sometimes it goes longer than that, but you get the point. A union of story. And then lastly, it's a union of incorporation. We are members of the body of Christ. And that's a, that's a powerful metaphor to think about how close our union is that God would call us his body on earth now. That's a pretty close union. Think about how close your body is to your soul, right? And um, so we are, we are members one of another, and therefore we have a spiritual relationship with our brothers and sisters that we've enjoyed this week and that we enjoy when our churches are alive and we're alive and we're able to benefit from, from that. All of this are part of the treasures of Christian psychotherapy. So just to summarize, Christ and the believer are joined together forever by the Father. And this is the, this is the best news 
of what it means to be a believer, and we want to make much of this in our counseling and in our therapy. So, um, you know, it just so happens that in English, over the last 10 years, there's been about seven books written on union with Christ. And I want to encourage you to track some of them down. Um, some of them are quite theological. If you, if you like Greek, maybe there's a few Greek people here, I mean, uh, Greek scholars or whatever, or people who have studied the New Testament in Greek, because there, there's an amazing book called Union with Christ in Paul. I think, that's, I think that's what it's, Union with Christ in Paul, by Constantine Campbell, who's a Greek specialist. I think he teaches at Trinity, uh, Evangelical Divinity School. But it, 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 he takes all the passages in Paul on union with Christ, and he first writes the Greek out, which I can't read Greek very well, but then he's fortunately he's got an English translation, and then he's got a paragraph of discussion. If you're up for that, it's very challenging, but if you're up for that, I encourage you to get a hold of that. It's, it's amazing. It's almost devotional theology because the topic is so good. Most of us are going to be more comfortable reading an, a book by Rankin Wilborn. It's just called Union with Christ. It's got a blue circle on it. If you, if you type Union with Christ into Amazon in Poland, it comes up. The first, it's the first book. It just got nominated. It just, it just won an award from Christianity Today in America. Uh, best book in, this, in a particular category. And it's written for everyday Christians. It's, and it's a devotional book. At any rate, I encourage you to become more familiar with this doctrine of union with Christ, with whatever kind of counseling you do. <coughs> However, our, our union with Christ has created a problem for us. It's created a division in our innermost being. A death-resurrection division caused by Christ. Christ's story has been um, introduced into our story, into our souls, if I can put it even more strongly than that. And as a result of that, we have an inner division that we live with. Now, there's a kind of division that non-Christians have that some non-Christians are aware of. Um, from a Christian standpoint, we would say it's the contrast between our created goodness and our fallenness that all human beings share. We all have that in common, that we were created good, but now we're fallen. And even non-Christians are aware of that. Sometimes in, in some old cartoons, you may may remember some of you, you know, the angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other, meant to symbolize the struggle that most honest non-Christians are aware of. But for us, that struggle has been much more intensified because we've been drawn into the death and resurrection of Christ. So I want to just focus a few, uh, uh, on a few passages that underscore this. One of them is that, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we probably memorize some of these verses. You're a new creation in Christ. The old is passing away. Behold, new things have come. Paul is the, you know, he's the great Christian psychologist in the, in the canon, in the Bible, and he writes about this contrast more directly um, in some clear ways than probably any other apostle. And uh, he, he contrasts the flesh and the spirit. The flesh, uh, which, which also, um, the way that I make sense of it is that the flesh is synonymous with our indwelling sin. Now there's some nuances there. They're not identical words, but there's, they're overlapping terms that are uh, uh, referring to basically the same spiritual dynamic that's opposed to God. It's opposed to the Spirit. And so the flesh fights against the Spirit, but it's also the part of us that is, uh, uh, some theologians have called it indwelling sin, based on Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul's teaching there, indwelling sin. The Puritans called it remaining sin, which I also like. It's this idea, it's the sin I still have that remains in me even though I'm a believer. 
But sin in Romans 7 has a, is, is like a kind of a power. It's captured me. It makes me do things that I don't want to do, and, and uh, it prevents me from doing things I want to do that I have to deal with, I live with. Now, some commentators debate whether or not that's an accurate reflection of the Christian life. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a New Testament expert, but I want to say this. The majority of exegetes over the centuries have said, of course it's a Christian. And all I can say is, I know it reflects my experience quite well. And so together, the history of the church majority, I would say probably 90%, as I'm guessing, uh, says that that's a, talking about a believer. And certainly my experience... Um, so I'm comfortable concluding that, that, uh, that, that we have this indwelling sin power that fights against us. And then a very interesting few passages that we translate now in English, at least, as the old self and the new self. Very interesting concepts there. There are not much, you know, it's only, it's only three passages. He only uses the words three, these three, three times. But what I want to do is I want to make a lot of that. I want to take the, this teaching and kind of say, this is the beginning point. This is the starting point of biblical revelation that God has given us about this. And then I'd like to develop a psychology of all of that. that that's my job as an academic to, to develop that kind of thing. So what might that look like? Well, this is where I'm at. This is as far as I've gotten so far on this. I would say the old self and the new self are psychological structures, as I've tried to make sense of what Paul's getting at. They're psychological structures that are composed of thousands of, of, of small little created dynamic structures stored in memory and constituted in our brains, constituted in neural networks that form our self. So that's a lot of jargon, and you know. But let me read it again. It's a, the, the, the old self is a psychological structure that's composed of a, of thousands, maybe you know, hundreds of thousands of of units of of thoughts, memories, emotions, beliefs, and so forth that um, are stored in our memories that accumulates over the course of our lives as we develop a self, which is. A self is my understanding of who I am. Just that's one way of putting it. It's my understanding of who I am. And that develops over the course of my life. But it's grounded in my brain so that, so that my, we understand better now how our selves develop. And they, they develop as a result of our neural, our, our, the, 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 the neurons in our brain getting organized around certain themes. For example, who I am. All right. Let me elaborate on that a little bit more. Therefore, the old self and the new self is a product of the course of our development. And I'm going to repeat a little bit. Each of them consisting of memories, emotions, desires, beliefs, ways of thinking, and ways of relating. So, all of us, before we were converted, were an old self. But that's all we had, so it wasn't old. It was all we are. And that's where we lived in our fallenness, without God in the world, alone, in a cosmic, ultimate kind of a sense, alienated from our create, creator and living an independent, autonomous life. And some of us got... I got saved when I was 18, so I had a lot of old self development that occurred before I became a Christian. Some people got saved at age five or seven. Some people in, in their 40s. But, but whatever, that, all the development that we lived apart from Christ was who we, was, was, was the, is the old self once a person becomes saved. Now, when does the new self develop? Or when, do, when does it emerge? When I was born again, the new self became alive. That was the birth of the new self. Uh, in, in 1 John chapter 3, 
Paul, uh, John, sorry, John refers uh, to the seed of new life. And I would say that's planted in us when we're born again, the seed of new life. The way that I think about it, excuse me, um, is that I start out being an old self, and then the seed of new life is planted in me, and that's my new self is born. And, and so the growth of my new self is as I develop and grow and more and more in Christ, as I meditate on him, as I love him, as I go to church, as I fellowship with other believers, all of this develops new memories, new self memories, new self emotions, desires, beliefs, ways of thinking about the world, and ways of relating to other people that constitute my new self. And it also forms neural networks that are connected to who I am in Christ. I, based on this redemptive historical division of the old self and the new self, I believe that one helpful thing that we can do in our counseling and in our therapy is to help Christians differentiate these two sides, if, if you will, these two redemptive historical aspects of myself. And I call this redemptive differentiation or differentiation in Christ. Conformity to Christ Conformity to Christ or Christiformity involves, I think in part at least, seeing all of oneself in reference to Christ. It means identifying all that's old in me as old and all that's new in me and related to God's goodness towards me and in me in reference to Christ. So that not only did God create a division in me by joining me to his son, but now you and I are to spend time differentiating these parts of us. And as we do that, we get greater clarity about who we are. And our new self will develop. And what's supposed to happen is our old self gets weaker. That's the goal of Christiformity, of conformity to Christ. Well, what does that look like? The way that I think about it is we need to differentiate different aspects of ourselves in order to get this kind of clarity. So this side of the diagram is my new self. It includes all my created goodness that God has given me from my, my conception, really. Um, it's created goodness is the goodness that we have, whether or not we were Christians. Gifts, strengths, abilities, our bodies, our, our sex. This is our created goodness that we have. That, that is, you might say, I think of this, this is your name. Your name you put here. You were given a name when you were born. And that refers to your created self and all that God has given you. But... That created self has been redeemed. It's now in union with Christ. And redemption includes all the blessings that we have because of our union with Christ. So that Eric Johnson is best understood as Eric in Christ. That's really my name. You don't have to call me that, but that's, that's who I really am if you knew me the way God knows me. I'm Eric in Christ, and that includes all my created abilities as well as all the blessings of who I am in union with Christ. That's my new self. This is my old self. This is all this part of me that has been contaminated and formed as a result of me being a fallen creature growing up in a fallen world. And it includes my sinfulness, my original sin, my sin dispositions, and my sin behaviors, my actions, my sin. But I think it, be, it also includes our damaged created structures. 
damaged creation. So, for example, um, I, we are created with an anger mechanism that is supposed to get angry in the face of injustice or mistreatment or frustration of goals. And it's a good thing originally created, the way God designed it. However, if I grow up with angry parents, I'm going to internalize their sinful anger as well. And my anger mechanism is going to get warped and disordered by that. I need to learn how to put to death the sinfulness of that anger mechanism, but I don't want to put to death the anger mechanism. I, I, I actually struggle with this. I actually don't get angry enough. Some people blow up a lot, okay? My problem is I don't get angry enough. I should get angry. I can tell this is a situation where I should be angry, but I, but I don't feel it. And that's because I so have squelched my anger mechanism that I shut it down. Once in a while, I get access to it. One time I was having an argument. Uh, no, my, my wife said something kind of mean to me. Um, and uh, I, I've said many mean things to her. Okay, so, um, you know. But it just so happened this one day, she said something that was kind of harsh. And I turned to her and I said, that's not fair. And we kind of stopped. And I said, hey, that was pretty good, wasn't it? And she, she said, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> because we had talked about this, you know, and it's a problem that I have, you know. So we all have different kinds of struggles, but that's an example of damaged creation, and so I'm in a process of getting healing so that I can have anger that's fitting and appropriate in the situation better than it was. This is, so what do we do with this damaged creation? We don't want to put it to death like we do sin, but rather we want to redeem it and bring it into our new self. And what this, what this diagram points us to is that each, each of these quadrants has to be treated differently in counseling. We, we, in order to make much of these things, we have to approach each one separately. So with the creation, that, this creational part is that that's the good foundation that we want to build on. We want to celebrate our created goodness. One of the ways we do this is through gratitude. We, we thank God for our gifts and our abilities. We own them. I, I might have asked this question before, but it's fitting to ask again. Do you have a hard time accepting compliments? You know, somebody compliments you and you go, oh, you, no, that's not, you know. Well, I want to encourage you that if God gave you that gift, maybe it's kind of dishonoring if you don't say thank you. Now, what, what distinguishes a Christian thank you from a non-Christian thank you? Gratitude. So we say thank you to the person, and then in our hearts we say thank you, Jesus. Now, we might say it to the person, but sometimes that can be a little dicey, you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's just about God, thank, thank the Lord, you know what I mean? And then it's not so owned. You, you, you see what I'm saying? This is kind of subtle stuff, but it's like, no, thank you, Jesus, that I have this strength, and this person has seen it. You see? So creation, we want to we thank God for. Damaged creation, we want to redeem it. And ideally, we want to heal it where possible. But we have to recognize not everything is going to get healed in this life. We're gonna, some of us are going to have besetting patterns uh, that, that in certain situations are going to get activated. And we thought we solved that problem a long time ago. And then, boom, it comes out again. It's like, oh, some of us are going to struggle with some things that will never be resolved. Um, certain kinds of biological disorders like autism. You can improve it to some degree, but you can't cure autism uh, currently. Although they are working actually on some stem cell research on autism. I hope it's ethical, but I just was hearing about that. At any rate, whatever our damaged creation is, we want it to be redeemed. And whether it gets healed or not, we bring it to the Lord 
and we own, we own who we are. Maybe I'm still kind of broken in this area. Maybe I'm not so good at anger, but that's who I am. That's a part of who I am, and God loves Eric Johnson in Christ. And all of it I can embrace in my redemption in Christ. Even my, even my brokenness, or what yesterday we called weakness, asthenia, because God's strength and glory is manifested there. The sin, what do we do with the sin? We don't, we don't make peace with sin. We, sin is the, is, the, is, the, is the quadrant that we put to death. You, Paul uses very strong language. The, there are some Christians that have been influenced by Carl Jung's uh, psychology, and he had a concept of the shadow. And he said you need to be, and which is a great insight in secular uh, secular psychology, because they don't have a place for the evil side of us. But for Carl Jung, he said, you need to befriend your shadow. That's not a Christian conception. Because Paul said, you got to put the shadow to death. Stab it, spear it. You know, I, I, uh, I like watching um, movies like Lord of the Rings, and I imagine orcs being a part of my old self. Did that make sense in English? Uh, okay. So, so I, I think we can use metaphors and stories also to help us understand this, the Christian battle. And so sin is something that we kill, we put to death. And I sometimes use my imagination and I, I stab my old self and he falls over dead and I say, yeah, dead, my old self. And it resonates in my soul. I'm not... I, I, I can feel the death a little bit, a little bit deeper by, by using that imagery, that mental imagery of putting it to death. Paul gave us that language. The Holy Spirit gave us that language. And then redemption is, this is where it's all going. This got crucified in the cross. Everything else is being raised from the dead. We're, this, so let me say that again. It's really important. As, our, as Christ's story is being woven into our story, this is being crucified, and this is being raised from the dead. So that more and more, Romans 6, Paul says we are learning how to walk in newness of life and taking everything to the Lord, basically. So I think that counseling in Christ in, entails sorting out these different aspects, and then helping people to work on whatever aspect they need to work on more. Sometimes I will actually give an assignment. I want you to write about, tell me about this part of you. Right On another page, this part of you. Another page, this part of you. And another page, this part. And of course, you know what I'm wanting to do is to have them ultimately see this as their new self in Christ. But just one, one, one exercise that uh, is very telling is, um, I can say, I want you to write all of the created goodness that God has given you, or let's say five things that you think are created goodness. And then the next week I might say, write down five sins that you struggle with. Guess which assignment is easier for most Christians? The sins, yeah, we're, we're very mindful of them, and we should be. I don't want to say that, that that's important work too. But if, if our new self is to grow, this has to become stronger than this. And you, you remember Romans 7, one of the things about Romans 7 that was so amazing, and you, it's echoed in 2 Corinthians 3, is the law kills us. And if we focus too much on our sin, 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 it actually inhibits our ability to be raised from the dead. It's weird, but sin works that way. Sin is so insidious and destructive. So we have to make sure that we spend, I would say, more time on this overall in the course of our lives than this quadrant. Everybody's different. Some people who are very narcissistic, they need to admit that they struggle with sin. That We might have to focus them on this quadrant, but most of the people that I see have a harder time owning 
their, their goodness, and, 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 and especially to help people meditate on the treasures that they have in Christ. I have a list of, of verses on union with Christ that I give to my counselees, and I say meditate every day on a different one of these passages because this is who you are in Christ, to own that and to build that up. Vivification is an is a, a important theological term that Christians in the Middle Ages and in the Reformation era have used to describe this strengthening of the new self, this growth of the new self. And I, I just want to point out that, that that takes time. And you know, maybe I could ask this question, why do we do devotions? What are our devotions for? Why, why do we have a prayer time and a meditation time? A lot of Christians don't really know. They just know they're supposed to do it. And they know that they don't do it enough and they feel bad about it. And so if you want to make a Christian feel guilty, you ask about their prayer life. And they'll say, yeah, I'm not doing so good. None of us are doing so good. But that's why we're united. We need to be in union with Christ because he's doing really good in heaven. He's praying all the time for us. And you're in Christ. So it doesn't matter how good your prayer life is. I know that sounds almost scandalous to say it that strongly. But I think that's the implication of the gospel. I rest in Jesus' perfection, not my lack of perfection. Right? Okay. But our, our prayer time is important. Healthy Christians live to praise God. God, you are so good. You are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. So worship is an important part of our daily devotions. And secondly, I call daily devotion soul work time. It's time when we work on our souls. And this is important. You know, if we're working with people, if we're in ministry, or we're doing counseling, we're spending a lot of our day and a lot of our week ministering to others. How much time do you spend caring for your soul? Oh, Eric, we're not supposed to care for our souls because that's selfish. We're supposed to care for other people. And there is a truth to that. There is a very important truth to that. We're not supposed to be self-absorbed. Uh, we, we know that's the old way of life, is to only care about yourself. But what does it mean when our created self-love gets put to death on the cross, it's fallenness, and then it gets raised from the dead? What does that look like? I want to suggest to you that your soul's healing is the single most important task that you've been given. Putting it that way is, is very strong, but I, I, think, I think it's a sound conclusion. You can't actually fix anybody else. You can't change anybody else, really. The only part of the universe that you're in charge of is inside your body, and you're responsible to care for it. And this is redeemed self-love. This, this is the kind of self-love that Jesus was appealing to when he said, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world but you lose your own self? There is a, 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 a legitimate, healthy, healthy kind of self-love. Augustine wrestled with self-love a lot. And, and one of the ways that he put it is the, the, the person who loves himself best loves God more than himself. Isn't that a nice way of thinking about it? Compared to yourself, how much should you love God? Infinitely, right? It's all about the glory of God. We talked about that a few days ago. God's the center of the universe. It is all about him. But if we love God supremely, as he calls us to, then what are we going to do with the piece of the creation that he has given us sovereignty over to care for and to promote his glory. My healing 
is how I glorify him. Now, it might sound like I put it rather strongly. Maybe I did. I'm not saying I put it perfectly by any means. But I think all I'm doing is I'm repeating, I'm putting in different words this phrase. God is most glorified in us as we are most satisfied in him. And, and I just want to promote our satisfaction in him. And I think it involves taking, seeing all of our aspects in light of our union with Christ. This is how Jesus Christ now is getting glory in your life. Now, it's, it's very clear. The Bible makes very clear. None of what I've said ends here, right? It's always an outflowing. Glory never is kept to itself. Glory manifests itself in action, in love for others, loving your neighbor as yourself. And so, of course, this is heading towards others. But what I didn't understand when I was a young Christian is how God redeems me from my old self so that I can become a flourishing new self who's centered on God. So let me just finish with this few encouragements. You already know these things. I'm not telling you anything that you didn't already know, really, before you came to this today. But our, our new self gets stronger when we worship God. Going to church is designed for our well-being. Loving and enjoying the beauty of God is good for our souls. Special love of Christ is my Savior and my lover. It feels good because it is good. <laughs> it's good for our souls. Gratitude to God for our created self and gifts fulfilled in the new self. And then gratitude to God for our salvation. So these are therapy techniques that you've probably already been doing some of. And these are the ways in which the new self gets stronger in our souls and the souls of those that we work with. To summarize what this is about is, I'm, this, this lecture is about differentiation in Christ and also integration in Christ. How do I become a whole person in Christ? And I'm suggesting it's through weaving together particularly the death of Christ into my fallenness and putting to death my sin or taking captive my weaknesses for him and seeking to grow in my created goodness and my redeemed goodness that God has given me so that my new self becomes increasingly uh, larger as it were, larger as I grow and more and more influential in my, in myself. And that's, that's, the, that's how the, uh, the death of Christ is being woven into my soul and, and body, and it's how the resurrection of Christ is being woven into my soul and body.